Well, I'm excited about our brand new series called Brand New. And this time during the year, we're always thinking about resolutions, how we can change certain things about our life. And resolutions are a tacit admission that we like, we want some new things going on in our lives. And so I'm excited about spending today and the next four weekends studying through the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Colossae and helping everyone who's in our hearing to discover this new life that God has for us in Christ. Let me tell you just a little bit about each message. Today we're gonna to talk about a brand new start, and then next week we'll talk about a brand new perspective, and then the third week we'll talk about a new foundation that we have, and then week four, a brand new lifestyle that God gives us, and then we'll finish up by talking about a brand new purpose. And so I hope that you'll make every effort to be a part of each service. And if you can't be here, that you'll watch online because I do believe that God wants every one of us to have a brand new, fresh, vigorous life in him. Now to help you get the most out of this series, I wanna just challenge you to do one thing. I wanna challenge you to immerse yourself in this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees and around 35 AD, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and his life totally changed. He got a new life. He had to go through such a radical change. He went away by himself for a while and God really had to redo his whole way of thinking. In fact, he experienced Jesus in a very real way during that time. And through the 50s, he began to plant churches all across the northern crest of the Mediterranean Sea. And then he continued to write to them letters of encouragement, letters of clarity, letters to help them understand more about this new life that they had in Christ. Now, in the year 60 to 62, we're not exactly sure, he was arrested and taken to Rome. And while he was in prison, he wrote four additional letters to these churches, and they are called the prison letters or the prison epistles. He wrote to the church at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, the church at Colossae, and to an individual by the name of Philemon. Now, we're gonna be focusing on his letter to the church at Colossae, and Colossae is in modern-day Turkey right here, and it's really a part of a tri-city area. There were three cities right there together, Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae, about 100 miles away from Ephesus on the coast. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand. Every one of the letters that Paul wrote, there was some kind of occasion. There was something going on, something that was important that he wanted to communicate. And what was going on at Colossae is this. There was a philosophy. Some people call it the Colossian heresy. But there was a way of thinking that was troubling and disturbing the church. And Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to write to them to bring some clarity and to help them understand the true nature of this life in Jesus. And so here's what I want you to do. I wanna challenge you to read through this letter multiple times over the next four weeks. It really only takes about 12 to 15 minutes to read through the entire letter. And so in preparation, a week before last and the two weeks before that, I read through the letter almost every day just to let it sink into my mind and heart. And if you've never done this before, I really wanna challenge you to read it every day and to allow God's word to really begin to permeate your thoughts, your mind, and then begin to flow out into your actions, all right? If you'll do that, this series will have a significant impact on your life. Now, before we jump into the text, I want to share with you a story that I got from Rankin Wilburn's book called Union with Christ. And it's a, it's a fictional story, but it really kind of sets the scene uh, for what we'll be talking about today. He said, imagine for a moment that you're a part of a very dysfunctional family and your parents are harsh and they're hypercritical and you can never please them. And as a matter of fact, 
they don't really please you either. But one day, you're up in the attic rummaging around and you come across this old dusty trunk and you open it up. Inside of it are some worn papers. You begin to read them and you begin to read something that astonishes you. These are not your real parents. They actually abducted you. And the further you read down, you read about your real parents. And your real parents, your mom was a painter at the Sorbonne in Paris. And your father, before he became a Nobel Prize winning scientist, was a professional baseball player. And they are actually incredibly wealthy. And you have an inheritance. As you read that, all of a sudden things are going, yes, I felt like I was something more. This is beginning to make sense. Now, Rankin Wilburn says, well, you know, this is, this is a fanciful story, but you get it. That if that happened to you, as you read that, it would change everything about you. You would see your life in a completely different light. Who you are, what your true identity is, what your capabilities and capacities are, what your future could be, what your destiny is. And you would come down out of that attic with new eyes to see everyone and everything. You would be changed. You would be new. You would be invigorated. Now, the truth about this is this. You were all of those things before you read the papers in the trunk. It was in history. You had the DNA to prove it but it was hidden from you and you did not understand who you truly were until you saw it. And I believe that is exactly a story about each one of us that we have an identity. We have a possibility of a new start in Jesus, but until we see it, until it's open to us, we can't begin to live into it. And so I want to begin, and we're going to talk about you know, this new start and all that it brings. So the gift of a new life begins with a new start. And uh, I want to skip down to verses 13 and 14 of Colossians chapter 1, which you've already heard read because it really talks about this new start. For he, speaking of Jesus, has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and has transferred us. I'm kind of thinking, you know how you pick up a puppy by the nape of the neck and you put it you know, in his pen or whatever, you let, take it out of the crate and you put it into real life. That's, it's kind of like the image of he picks us up and takes us and puts us in a new place. He transfers us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Now, here's what this new start means. It means that now we're living in a new sphere of influence. Now, the word sphere literally means the place or the environment in which we live or exist. And what Paul is saying is before we met Jesus, we were living under or in the sphere of darkness. And that darkness is made up of the influence of the evil one himself it's made up of the secular material values of a culture. It's made up of our own sinful nature inside of us. And we are enslaved to it, Paul writes. But when we experience Jesus, when we turn our life over to him and trust in him, he transfers us from this sphere of darkness and places us now under the sphere of light, the sphere of the kingdom of his dear son, and he says, when that happens, we have a new freedom. We are free from the clutches and the influence and the bondage of darkness. And now we are free to become all that he ever intended for us to be. And we are given a clean slate. All of our sins are forgiven and wiped away. You know, we just came out of Christmas and, uh, you know, we have three grandkids and they live in Pennsylvania. So we go there every Christmas. And so when you have to travel like that, you know, most of our Christmas money goes to plane tickets and presents for the grandkids, right? If you have grandkids, you know what I'm talking about. And so we, we kind of scrimped a little bit on our presents for each other. And so I asked Robin what she wanted for Christmas. And she said, I want a magna doodle. And I said, a magna doodle? Okay. So I got her a magna doodle. Now y'all know what a magna doodle is, right? You know, you take a little pen and you can write on it and it's, there's magnetic pieces of, uh, of lead underneath there and you can draw on it, you can doodle on it, you can scribble on it, you can make mistakes on it, you can just put all kinds of junk on it. 
But when you're tired of it, you can just take this little lever right here and just push it across and it wipes everything clean. Jesus is kind of like our magnet doodle. That is, we have moments of regret. There are moments in our lives when our worst selves carried the day. And we all have those moments we can look back on and we know how broken we are and how sinful we are. But when you get this new start, it's like Jesus' death on the cross pays for our sins and he just wipes all of them away. It's a beautiful new start. In verse 22, chapter one, Paul goes on to talk about this again. He says, you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. You have been magna doodled in him, in your new start. Now, here's the thing. This new start comes with a new identity. And to get to this new identity, we're going to start back at the top of the letter and we're going to focus on verses 1 through 8 today. I wish I had time to go through all of those, 1 through 14, but we're going to land specifically on verses 1 and 2 and then a little bit on 3 through 8. If you have your Bible, your old school Bible, open it up. If you have your device, you're going to really benefit from this if you follow along scripturally with me as we go. All right, so along with this new start comes a new identity. All right, in verses one through two, we read these words. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. This is the way every letter from antiquity begins. It begins by the author revealing himself and his identity and then he talks about who he is writing to, and there's usually then a greeting after that. So Paul reveals his identity. Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle. An apostle is someone who speaks for a very important person, like the king, like Jesus, like God. He speaks and represents him, all right? And then he identifies the people he is writing to. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, in this little sentence, it's packed so much because Paul reveals our new identity. Here's the first one. You are a saint. That's what he calls these people. Now, the New Living Translation says the holy people of God but that little phrase has been translated throughout most of, cre most of Christian history as to the saints at Colossae. Now, whenever you hear the word saint, what do you think when you hear it? I used to think, well, a saint is somebody who's dead. I don't want to be a saint right now. You know, they're, they're already dead and they've been canonized by the Catholic Church. Or we might think a saint is like a person who is morally perfect. Or maybe a fan of the New Orleans football team. I don't know, but that's not what a saint is. A saint, a holy person, means someone who's been set aside by the grace of God to be a part of his people, a part of his family. And we become a part of his family. We become a part of the holy people. We become a saint when we trust Jesus as our Savior and Lord and live out our lives in such a way that we allow him to shape our values, our goals, and our actions. We live a life of tangible faithfulness. We are saints. And here's what I want you to know. In six of Paul's letters, some people believe he wrote 13, and sometimes people argue about how many, but in six of those letters, he addresses the people as I am writing to the saints at Ephesus or the saints at Philippi. On no occasion does Paul ever write to the sinners at Thessalonica or the sinners in Rome. But if I were to ask you, especially if you'd grown up kind of in conservative evangelicalism, how would you define your spiritual identity? I bet you many of you would say, well, I'm a sinner. And that's how we've been taught to identify ourselves. I'm a sinner. But here's the thing. Here's the trouble. We live, we think, 
We act, we speak, we live out of our identity. And if you think your primary spiritual identity is as a sinner, then you know what you're going to do? You're going to sin. <laughs> you're going to become what you think your identity is. And when you sin, you go, well, hey, listen, you know, I blew it here. I screwed up here. Well, you know, I'm a sinner. But here's the thing. <laughs> Jesus says, through Paul, you are not a sinner. You are a saint. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't sin still. It means our identity spiritually is we are a part of the family of God by his grace and through faith. And now if we live out of that identity, guess what? We begin to think and act like children of God. So I don't want you to miss this. When you think of your identity in Christ, you are a saint. In fact, Paul says in Colossians 2 verse 11, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. You have been changed in nature. You are no longer a sinner. You are a saint. And whenever you sin as a saint, you're going against your new nature. But your nature is a saint. And he calls us to live out of that. Now, here's the second new identity we have. It is you are in Christ. He says, I'm writing to you saints at Colossae, you faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And that little prepositional phrase packs incredible truth. Do you know that the most common description of a follower of Jesus in the New Testament is someone who is in Christ? It is mentioned 164 times. People are only identified as Christians on three occasions in the New Testament and never by Jesus and never by Paul. We are in Christ. What that means is, is that when we place our faith in Christ and we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, that we are united with him. We are now in union with him. We have joined him and he is in us spiritually and reality and we are in him. We are in Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, I wish I had time to talk about all that means. I've had to kind of cut it down a little bit, but here's the first thing. Being in Christ means, or being in Christ is the highest possible expression of your identity. It is the highest possible expression of our identity. Now, like we identify ourselves in different ways. Like, I'm a white male. I am a, a son, a husband, a father. I am a Texan American. You know, I'm politically independent. You know, I'm a Baylor fan. I have all these ways that I identify myself, right? You have them too. You know what I'm talking about? Now, here's the thing. I am also in Christ, and being in Christ is the highest possible expression of my identity. Because if I allow anything else to be the highest expression, it becomes my idol. Because you see, whatever you see your ultimate identity as, that's how you think and that's how you act. That's what determines things for you. So when I think about my role as a man, I want to be masculine under Christ a man like he was, his courage, his sacri willingness to sacrifice. When I think about being a husband, I want to be a husband in Christ. When I think about my political life, I want to be whatever you may be, a Republican or a Democrat or independent. You want to be that, but it's under Christ. If you're like a, an Aggie, you're an Aggie, but you're in Christ as an Aggie, right? It's harder for Aggies sometimes to understand that, right? But it's but the deal is, I'm a, I'm a Baylor guy, but I'm in Christ. So that's what I do not want you to miss, that in Christ is the ultimate expression of your identity. Now here is the spiritual crisis we're in. The spiritual crisis of our day is that we settle for lesser identities that fail to capture our whole and truest selves. In our culture today, we focus on sexual orientation identity. We focus on... Uh, racial identity, you know, we focus on gender identity, and all these things are important. 
But as a member of the white race, that's what's not important. It's not as important as being a white person under and in Christ. You see, that is to inform my whole understanding of my race. So whether I'm black or I'm brown, those things are important and we celebrate those, but our ultimate expression is in Christ. Does that make sense? Now, uh, being in Christ also is another aspect. It, it connects us to a new family. Uh, that's something I think we need to perhaps understand now more than any other time. Uh, what happens is when you're in Christ, you're also connected to other people who are in Christ. And they become a part of your family. That's why we do small groups. That's why the earliest New Testament church met together in homes. They had fellowship. That is, they participated in each other's lives together. They were brothers and sisters. And that became the most important set of relationships because they understood that's their primary identity. Right? And that's why I love Rooted, because when you get in Rooted and you're a part of a group of other men and you love each other, you care for one another, you guide one another, it, it gives you a sense of this possibility of a new life. But here's something I, I want to share with you today that I think we really struggle with, and maybe this will take you a while to work through this, but this family that we're a part of in Christ, it's a family with non-traditional kinship ties. It's a family with non-traditional kinship ties. What's the kinship tie in our normal family? What? Blood, right? And we tend to be a part of other families. Like, I, I, I like to hang with my race or my ethnicity. I, I like to hang with people who are from Texas. I like to, I have a family that's an American family. Then I, you know, I have all these different things that kind of define my families. But here's what, Jesus wants us to know is that in him, those barriers that keep people apart are blown up and they are destroyed. In Colossians 3 verse 11, we'll get to that later. Here's what Paul writes. In this new life that we're talking about in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. In the book of Galatians, he says, male or female, Christ, listen to this, Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. In Christ is our ultimate identity. Now, here's a beautiful picture of that. Here's a picture of some NFL players who get together after a football game. And here's the deal. They each have an identity. One team, they identify as the Kansas City Chiefs. The other identifies as the Denver Broncos. And they compete against each other. And they go to war against each other. But when the game is over, what do they do? They kneel. And they put their arms around each other. And they pray together because they recognize that their ultimate identity is not as a chief or a bronco. Their ultimate identity is that they are in Christ and they are brothers. Do you see that? Now you can put different groups of people in this huddle. You can put a group of Republicans and Democrats in there and they can go to war and they can fight and they can argue. But at the end of the day, if you're a Christian and you're a part of a political party, in Christ is your ultimate expression. And so there can be a time when you come together at the end and you put your arms around each other and you pray together because you recognize that we're not enemies. We are in Christ. And that's our highest identity. You could put, you have black players here. You have white players. You have brown players here. You can put people from all different races and we can appreciate the value of each race and the ethnicity and all the wonderful things about it. But at the end of the day, all that matters is Christ because he is in all of us. See? And that's one thing that we, I believe, as followers of Jesus have to come to grips with right now in this day that in Christ is our highest expression of identity and our highest allegiance is not to groups 
that might be a political party or my Baylor nation or the fact that I'm a Texan as opposed to someone from the Northwest or where the case is, you know, my highest allegiance is always to people in Christ, no matter what, all right? Now, here's the thing I don't want you to miss. Of all the blood, of all the ties that bind us, Jesus' blood is thickest of all. Never forget that. That's what we are called to. Now, there's one last thing. Being in Christ leads to a transformed life. You see, we live out of our identities, and the more we understand, I am in Christ, I am a saint, I'm a part of the family of God, I begin to think like Jesus, and I begin to act like Jesus, and some things begin to happen in my life, I am transformed. And so we read about this process in verses 3 through 8. We always pray for you, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. And I love verse 6. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere, changing lives, just as it changed your lives From the first day you heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about your love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. Now, three things just very quickly. Love is the preeminent sign of a transformed life. Paul says, man, I'm so grateful for your faith in Jesus and the fact that it's already transformed your life, that you are known by the way you love God's people everywhere. And the truth of the matter is Jesus focuses on love more than anything else. It's a part of the great commandment. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Before he was crucified, he spoke to his disciples. In John 13, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love others as I have loved you. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, the apostle Paul says, In Jesus there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. There's neither Jew or Gentile. The, listen to this. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. Faith expressing itself in love. And indeed, when we live out of our new identity, we become increasingly loving. All right? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, you will begin, um, God uses, the, the, God's grace is the catalyst for the life change that we're going to experience. He says that in verse six. You know, it, the gospel is going out to the rest of the world and people's lives are being changed just like you were changed the first time you heard this wonderful good news. And the good news of Jesus is a positive message. God loves you. He wants to rescue you. He wants to give you a new life and new hope. In Romans chapter two, verse four, the apostle Paul says, do you not know that it is the kindness of God that leads you to repentance? You know, so many times we lead with threat and we lead with judgment, although judgment is a part of the gospel. But when you lead with that, people only respond to it for the sake of saving their own hide. But the gospel is best served when we lead talking about the wonderful grace of God that loves us and forgives us and sets us free from the power of darkness. And when we talk about this wonderful grace, that's what changes people's lives. And then God uses people to communicate his life-changing grace. That's what he says, Epaphras is your friend. He grew up in Colossae, and he's the one who told you about this. He calls Epaphras a co-worker, a faithful servant of Christ, and he's the one who brought them this good news. And so the truth of the New Testament is this, is that every one of us who identifies as in Christ and as saints, that we are called then to go and to be instruments of this grace in the world. We are God's plan A for others to experience this life. 
just like Epaphras went back and shared this incredible news with the people with whom he lived, worked, and played, he was willing to go and be with them. It is truly amazing what happens when you experience a new life and understand this new identity and you live it out. It changes everything. Clay Rains is a part of our church and he has a, a testimony of how this very truth has changed his life. Take a look. I'm Clay Sains. Uh, I'm one of the uh, small group leaders for the 10th grade boys, uh, Preston Trail Student Minister Group. And then I am a firefighter paramedic for the city of McKinney. Growing up, I mean, I went to church, but I wouldn't really say it was a relationship with God. I had no real purpose or drive. Like, you know, I had a great job. You know, I had focus on a career, but I didn't really have anything for me or to really push me to do anything. There were certain things, you know, I'd seen from work and just in life that made me question, you know, if there was a God that everybody's so in love with, if it's there, you know, how can he do these things to certain people and do that? The biggest issue then would have been anger. Um, I just, I didn't, I didn't know who to be upset with. Like, was it me? Was it other people? I'd been a couple times to Preston Trail before um, I actually started going. Uh, my mom had always had us do like a little Christmas Eve thing. So we'd come to church, this would be just Christmas Eve service. She started asking me to come and she'd just ask, hey, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I finally started going and there was just this one service. You know, everybody says that the preacher's always talking to you. Like there's gonna be that one point you go in and no matter what you're going through, everything's gonna line up. Every cue point's gonna hit something. Um, it just, it hit me to that point when I got home. I couldn't stop thinking about it and uh, that was, really like the lowest of the lows. It was like you just fell down and crying out like, okay, you win, I'm done. I would say that was probably the biggest moment I've had to surrender myself in my life. The community here has opened it up to where it shows you that, hey, you kind of have to have a group to be able to prosper in a good way. So I got into the Ruta group, it was amazing. Um, it was a Tuesday night group and it was online, so I was able to make it all. I mean, you know, there were some work nights where I couldn't make it, um, but it was good enough to where that's now our Tuesday men's group and we meet every Tuesday. Just a little night with the boys. You know, we do our little worship stuff. We have a kind of a Bible study plan, but it's just a solid, just group foundation. Rooted taught me a lot about how you have to have community in Christ to be able to grow. This thing kept going across the screen, uh, you know, test drive, you know, hey, we need people that can help, you know, lead kids, you know, just come see if it's for you. You know, and it was just small little things here and there that kept saying it. My mom had said to me in the car, hey, you know, you should, you should try that. And I was like, nah, no, you know, I don't, I don't think I need to. And then one day I just did, so I emailed. It's like, hey, you know, I'm looking to get involved. You know, what can I do? That was probably the best decision I've made in a long time. And I think God found a place to put me in. First time I was baptized, I was 13 or 14. Um, I had just done confirmation with the church I was going to at the time. And really, you know, then and now looking back, I had no idea what that was. You know, I didn't know what I was doing, you know, I thought I did. But the second time around, we had had high def, 2020, um, which ironic, it was right before all this, you know, crud started going on. Um, you know, it was our last big thing we could have that was normal, but we were just sitting there. Um, it was right before they had ended the last service. They were doing some worship music and uh, the dudes just crowded around me. And then, you know, everybody you know, started putting their arms on each other. And it was just one of those moments where it was like, it was really good. Like, you know, we're all in that moment of worship together. and. Uh, it just came down like, all right, I'm gonna get baptized. The second time for me, honestly, was God letting me push the reset button. It's been awesome ever since. Like, it's just I, that sense of renewal is what it really has been. I don't deal with a lot of anger anymore. You know, I don't deal with a lot of the worrying about the what ifs. Um, really, you know, coming back to God and actually trusting and, you know, wanting to follow Him and, you know, do as best I can. Everybody's gonna mess up, but. You know, it gives me that comfort to where I can take every day and just be like, you know what, God's got my back. And it really has given me a new, a new way to enjoy life, you know, even with all the negative. Before Preston Trail, you know, it was, it wasn't really a good life, it seemed like, you know, lost, you know, not really focused on anything, didn't really know what my purpose was. Um, but really after getting community here and growing with God, and, you know, finding my way back to faith, you know, it's, it's a brand new life. That's Clay's story. What is yours? I'd like to take a few moments now and pray for your story and my story as we end our time together.
Father, thank you for each one who is with us today, whether online, whether in McKinney, whether here in Frisco. And Father, you know our stories intimately, and you know whether or not we really need a new start. Just like Clay recognized he needed a new start, I pray, Father, that you will give people here a new awareness of the potential of a new identity, a new life they can have in you. And Father, even in these quiet moments, I pray that just in their hearts that their words will begin to be formed and they might say, yes, Lord, I'm ready for that. I'm willing to trust you to transfer me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son, that kingdom of love and light and forgiveness and mercy. Father, many of us have experienced a new start, but we're not fully living out our new identity. And Father, I just pray for myself and others that indeed, especially in these troubling times of COVID, political unrest, that we will live our lives in you. And that we will truly live the life of a saint, someone who follows you, who is a light to those around us. And Father, I pray that because of your faithfulness to us and our faithfulness to you, that we can be a part of the solution in our world. In Jesus' name, amen.